Uh, good afternoon, everyone, or good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, my name is Duncan Manville. I'm a litigator with Sabbath Bruce and Willie in Seattle, and I'm the co-chair of the CLE Committee of the Federal Bar Association of the Western District of Washington. Uh, on behalf of the FBA of the Western District of Washington and the Ninth Judicial Circuit Historical Society, I'd like to welcome you to the second session of our Courts During COVID series, Trials Over Zoom. So we have an amazing program tonight, and it's only one of many programs that the FBA of the Western District of Washington and the NJCHS put on. Uh, the primary mission of the FBA of the Western District of Washington is to provide a link between the federal judges and lawyers who serve this district uh, and improve the federal judicial process for the courts, for lawyers, and for litigants. And the mission of our program partner, uh, the NJCHS, is to preserve the legal history of the West and more generally to provide education about the importance of an independent judiciary. I'd like you to encourage you to become a member of the FBA of the Western District of Washington, if you're in this district, uh, and to become a member of the NJCHS or at least get on their mailing list. Uh, you can get a link, uh, you can use the link in the chat box uh, to find out more about the NJCHS and we'll also email you the link after today's program. Uh, before we begin, a couple of housekeeping items. First, for those of you seeking CLE credit for today's program, you'll need to pay attention to the chat box on your screen. A numeric verification code will appear in the chat box about midway through the program. For those of you on the phone, Judge Rothstein, our moderator today, will read the verification code aloud. You'll have to record the code in order to receive CLE credit. After the program is over, uh, visit the njchs.org website um, to complete the CLE verification form, which will call for this code. The form is available at njchs.org uh, forward slash CLE hyphen verification hyphen form. And I believe this link was included in the event uh, email sent to you prior to the program. Once you've submitted the form, the NJCHS will process it and will send you your certificate of attendance or for those of us in Washington, we'll submit your information directly to the WSBA. Uh, second, the chat box uh, is the place for you to submit questions that you may have for our panel. Uh, I'll be monitoring the chat box during today's program. And depending on how things go, Judge Rothstein and the members of our panel may also monitor the chat box and may address some of your questions uh, in close to real time. Now, let me uh, introduce our panel. Our speakers merit lengthy uh, introductions and descriptions of their many accomplishments, but in the interest of maximizing their time with you, uh, I'll give them the very briefest of introductions. Their full bios, and even these are abbreviated bios, have been made available to you as part of the CLE materials for this program uh, on the website of the NJCHS, and I encourage you to refer to them. Our moderator today is the Honorable Barbara Rothstein. Judge Rothstein is a U.S. District Judge on the District Court for the Western District of Washington. Uh, she's been a District Judge since 1980. She's currently sitting by designation on the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia and is joining us today from the other Washington. So uh, special thanks to Judge Rothstein for joining us at what is a little after 7 p.m. her time. She received her undergraduate degree from Cornell University and her JD from Harvard Law School. She's the former director of the Federal Judicial Center in Washington, D.C. Uh, we have two other uh, two federal judges on our panel today. The Honorable Marsha Peckman has been a district judge on the U.S. District Court for the Western District of Washington since 1999. She was chief judge from 2011 to 2016. She received her undergraduate degree from Cornell University and her JD from Boston University Law School. And she has been a, a real driver of the uh, remote uh, trial experiment that the US District Court for the Western District uh, has been very successfully engaging in. The Honorable Judge Robert Lasnik has been a, a district judge uh, here in Western Washington since 
1998, I believe. He's nodding, I'm getting that right. Uh, she, uh, he served as a chief judge uh, from 2004 to 2011. He received his undergraduate degree from Brandeis University, uh, two master's degrees from Northwestern University in journalism and counseling, and his JD from the University of Washington School of Law. Uh, we have two lawyers on the panel, two practitioners. Mark Walters is a trial and uh, an appellate lawyer with Lau Graham Jones in Seattle. Uh, he's first chaired a number of jury trials to judgment and won multi-million dollar verdicts for clients, prevailed for defendants in, uh, in several bet the company cases. Um, he also advises technology firms on intellectual property strategy, including providing patentability and freedom to operate opinions. And Mike Wampold is a trial lawyer with Peterson Wampold, Bozado, Feldman, Luna, also in Seattle. Uh, he's had a very successful career, uh, including numerous multi-million dollar jury verdicts for injured clients. Uh, he's won a number of awards for his trial work and has taught legal seminars and trial advocacy all over the world. He is also an avid and quite speedy marathoner. Um, and now I'd like to turn things over to Judge Rothstein. Well, good evening from me, good afternoon to all of you. Um, just by way of introduction, every so often, the courts are confronted with developments in the world outside the world of law that require them to make changes at a pace that the law usually doesn't change. The law goes very slowly and how courts can respond to something that requires urgent changes we're sometimes good at, sometimes not so good at, but the instance before us this time is how the courts can respond to the COVID pandemic, which has brought trials in a courtroom setting to a halt. And one of the ways in which creativity has risen to the fore is the use of the remote civil jury trial. And that is something that the panel will be discussing because everyone on this panel has had experience with remote civil jury trials. I'm going to start out with Judge Peckman because she was involved from the very beginning and she knows the background. She knows how this took off and was very instrumental in getting it off the ground. So Judge Peckman, you want to give us some background on this? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, I tried my first Zoom trial, um, bench trial last June. And as a result of that trial, um, I put together an order and a handbook with the uh, assistance of the committee here in the court. After that happened, Chief Judge Martinez asked me if I would expand this into working with jurors so that we could have civil jury trials remotely as well. So we went through a rather lengthy process. The first thing that we did is we surveyed 600 potential jurors from our uh, jury pool in order to determine would they show up if we, if we summoned them in for jury duty. And what we found is that uh, over half of them would not. And so we were looking for another way to go forward with justice. So the committee was put together by staff here in the Western District of Washington with the IT department. We had law clerks involved. We had courtroom deputies um, and uh, we had magistrate judge, myself, uh, I chaired the committee. One of the first things we did is we took a breakdown of every single every single event that happens in a trial from the time that the summons goes out to the time that the verdict comes in. And we tried to analyze click by click how it is that we could take that reality and make it work on a remote platform. We tested platforms, we tested WebEx, we looked at Teams, and we decided that zoom.gov was the best platform for us to use. The next thing we did is I, um, I turned out the Ninth Circuit librarians. 
I call them the bloodhounds of research. And what they did is they went out and they researched, could we do this? Was it legal? And essentially what we found is that they, there isn't anything anywhere that tells you that you can't do it. There's also nothing anywhere that says you can. So we pushed forward under the theory that what is not forbidden is allowed. And we tried to make sure that all of the problems that we might confront in making sure our jury pool was diverse, making sure that we weren't cutting people out of, uh, of the process. We then went and drafted an order. It went through 13 drafts before we were happy with the draft that we put through to use as a template for judges to use with lawyers in planning their trials. We also uh, looked for ways to educate lawyers and staff of how to use the platform and how to go through the process. We wrote a handbook that uh, we decided was going to be necessary. The next thing we did is we ran a mock trial, just like many lawyers do with their trials. We ran a mock trial to see if we could pull this out off with mock jurors. Judge Zilly had a case that he thought would be perfect for it. And so we ran a mock jury trial and then debriefed the jurors to find out what their experience was. After that, we completed the handbook and we sent that out for beta testing to members of the Federal Bar Association to get their input. Could they follow the handbook, every click, every link to make sure that this was helpful for them? So I think uh, Judge Rostein, we tried very hard to make sure that we had a thorough process. Um, I made the decision that I was worried that we were gonna cut people out of who didn't have the access to these sorts of, uh, of iPads or, or computers or didn't have the expertise. And we decided that if they didn't, we were gonna train them. And if they didn't have the, um, the equipment, we were going to give them the equipment or loan it to them during the course of the trial. And we'll talk later about whether or not we were successful in doing that. But thank you. Okay, Judge Lasnik, let me turn to you. Your experience was with a bench remote trial. And I'm curious if you could tell us how different is it from a live trial? And um, what happens in one that doesn't happen in the other? Or maybe you could fill us in on that. Sure, uh, in the remote trial, I'm in the shower at 845 and on the bench at nine o'clock. Uh, I can't do that in a, a real life courtroom. Uh, and um, my trial was a very uh, expert heavy trial with um, treating physicians and uh, experts in the field of uh, neurology and in uh, birth defects and learning disability and education and being able to accommodate the experts without having them flown out to Seattle from Texas, from Washington DC, from Chicago, to be able to get people from Children's Hospital in Seattle who didn't have to take off an entire day to be at the courthouse or at least a half a day to be at the courthouse, um, to have people who you know, were, were in their surgical scrubs, uh, take a break, come do the testimony and then get back to work was really uh, an uplifting and, and enlightening thing. Uh, I didn't find any real problems with um, the difference in the bench trial, but, and, and I do wanna say, you have no idea what Judge Peckman went through to get the handbooks and the 13 drafts and putting a team together. I admire her creativity and her diligence so much, but, you know, Duncan read my background with a master's in journalism, or as they call it now, communication. And I do want to uh, remind people of our generation and inform people of the younger generation of a man named Marshall McLuhan, who said the medium is the message. 
And what that meant, because this is back in the 60s and 70s, way before we have the technology we have now, but even then, it said the means that the it means that the way we send and receive information is often more important than the information itself. And for you lawyers out there, if you don't understand that the medium through which content is carried plays a vital role in the way it is perceived, you're missing the boat. One of the ways uh, I, I read uh, the Civil Jury Project newsletter uh, and a King County Superior Court judge, um, uh, Matthew Williams talked about uh, aggression in a uh, Zoom trial is really off-putting to jurors. Uh, Zoom is a hot medium. It's not a cool medium. Uh, the courtroom is more of a cool medium. There's distance, there's uh, spacing, there's other things going on. But if you have a really aggressive attorney who's right in the jurors' faces, they're not liking that. So the lawyers need to think about how is the media gonna change my message? It was not a big issue in my bench trial, although it did come up from time to time, but I would think that it would be a huge issue in the jury trials. And I know you're gonna to turn to the lawyers and ask them, did they consider that? Well, I am gonna to turn to the lawyers. Let me start, Mark, let me start with you. Did you consider that? The difference perhaps in presentation between a remote trial and a live trial? You know, I did, um, be, but it wasn't really in any sort of like thoughtful or uh, it was just like, how am I going to do this? I was so, uh, at first I tried to avoid it. I, I said to Judge Peck when I said, you know, we object to this. Um, is there any way we can not have to do this? And she said, well, you could look as much as you uh, want, Mr. Walters, but you're, gonna not, you're not gonna find any authority uh, to support um, avoiding this. And we're not gonna let the wheels of justice grind to a halt. You're going to trial on December 14th and the gavel fell. And so I was scrambling a little bit to try and figure out how am I going to adapt? Um, you know, it took me a while in my career to get up enough courage and you know, willingness to actually do a trial live and you know you develop some um, uh, routines uh, and this threw off all of that uh, and so uh, so I, I didn't think of it, about it in any sort of deliberate or, or thoughtful way it was more of like how am I going to do this and and so I started um, by uh, having some associates in our firm um, you know do um, my I could do my opening in front of them um, I, I had um, friends and I had a you know, jury consultant that I work with uh, just sort of give me feedback on, on uh, my presentation style. And that was sort of how I tried to navigate it. But um, it is, it's different um, because uh, the focus when you're talking like, like I'm talking right now, the focus is on you and there's nothing uh, to draw the focus away uh, when, you're, when you're presenting. Mike, what about you? Did you find you had to prepare differently and uh, once you were going into a remote trial? Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of ways that you have to prepare differently. You have to think about all these things like um, getting a professional microphone, uh, which I went out and bought. Uh, it's $100 on uh, Amazon and this is a uh, blue something uh, microphone on Amazon. I got a special light um, that I put next to my computer. Um, and what we did in our office was we basically created the equivalent of the podium in federal court. And so I tried it with co-counsel who was in the same room, but we would just trade off at the podium. And so, you know, you have to think about your background and the lighting and the microphone and having, making sure you have a good camera. Um, all those types of things that you, you know, obviously don't normally think about when you're trying a case. Um, also, you know, I, I found that you, you need to get comfortable with the technology. So, for example, um, you know, because of COVID, we shouldn't be meeting with our witnesses in person anyway. And then it works out great to practice doing directs and crosses, um, mostly directs, um, practice doing directs with your witnesses on Zoom. And then same thing that Mark said is, you know, you need to practice, um, you know, openings, closings, do that all on Zoom so people can tell you, 
hey, when you're looking that direction, that doesn't look right. You need to look here so the jurors feel like you're looking right at them. And, you know, all the all these aspects of presentation that are very different uh, than being in a courtroom. Hmm. And were there, what was the most challenging part of it for you? Uh, so for me, uh, I guess to me, the biggest surprise, um, and I, I want to echo what Judge Lasnik said, I'm so grateful to Judge Peckman and all the work of the committee putting this together because the Western District has just been a leader um, in, in doing this and the rest of the country is now following suit and other um, county courts are, are following suit and I'm very grateful uh, for it. And I, I think Judge Rothstein, the answer to your question is I was mostly shocked at how great it all worked. I mean, you know, we had never done this before. Judge Peckman at the beginning said, it, it's going to be like we're building a bike while riding a bike. Um, and I thought that was pretty good. And, and uh, the truth of the matter is it was much smooth, smoother than that. And it was much more similar to a real trial than I think any of us dreamed. And so I think the shocking part was how well it all worked. Um, but the hardest part, to answer your question, was really getting any kind of general conversation going during jury selection, during voir dire. You know, when you ask those general questions, how do people feel about lawsuits? You know, those kind of general questions went down like a lead balloon. Um, so the, the better questions were very specific to the jurors. And so the one takeaway I had was really focus on those filtering questions that the judges asked or consider doing a questionnaire because the follow-up questions to jurors on Zoom were great. It was no different. In fact, maybe even better because you're you see their faces better and their kind of micro expressions better. Um, I thought that were great, but the general questions on, on jury selection, I thought did not work well. And I would say that was like really the, one of the only things that didn't work well uh, during trial, but that was one of them. Mark, did you find Wadir challenging too? I did. Um, I had the benefit, I was defending. So um, I, I did my Wadir second and so I had the benefit of following up on a lot of the things that the, the plaintiff had raised uh, during his voir dire. And I, I do agree, it, it's hard to break the ice in this, in this medium. And so finding, um, be, being very you know, attentive and listening very closely to anything interesting really that comes out of uh, the general sorting questions, um, or if, you're, if you have the benefit of going second and, and defending, anything that came up during the plaintiff's voir dire, following up, and that just kind of just gets the conversation going. But what's, what was challenging is that in the normal courtroom setting, you're able to observe the, a little bit more of the nonverbal um, cues that might be going on, because they're all in their seats in the jury box. They might lean back, you know, for a question. They might, you know, kind of, I mean, you can see a little bit more of the facial stuff, but just less of the what they might be trying to communicate or you know, either consciously or subconsciously about their feelings towards your case. That's a lot harder on this uh, medium. Judge Peckman, did you? Yeah, uh, I was, I wanted to comment on Bordier. I actually think that Bordier is one of the hardest parts of any trial. And uh, to be quite honest, that I think it's most difficult for lawyers and very few of them uh, are brilliant at it. Most of us are workmanlike at it. But these jurors are inviting us into their homes. And I was kind of shocked at how much more information you got from them because here's the guy who's sitting in his, in his laundry room. That tells you that's the space in his home that he has to be quiet. Somebody else is in their bedroom sitting on their bed. They're not lounging, but that's where they need to be. But small things you can observe. Um, you can see the pets walk through. You might see the books on the shelf. You might learn a, a lot just by looking at what's behind people. For example, Mr. Walters has a picture um, that I recognize is from the Supreme Court. Well, I asked him a question and he argued in front of the Supreme Court. Now, I got that just by looking at the environment. Last week when we practiced this, uh, the two lawyers were uh, vacationing uh, in snow country, and I nailed that as well. I knew that they were, I knew that they were out skiing just by what I saw uh, in the background. So I think, in many ways, um, you might feel a little constrained by this, but you're not going to get a chance to see people in their houses um, 
when they come into the courtroom. So, you know, there are pluses and minuses to this. What about, Judge Peckman, as long as we're talking about it, what about the representation amongst the jurors? Were you able to get a good representation or did the fact of it being remote limit you? Did you feel it was a broad enough sample? How did that go? Well, amazingly enough, I, we have both um, numerical and anecdotal data. What we found is that there were more people willing to respond to the, su to the summons and willing to participate than we get when we call them into the, into the courthouse. So we got a bigger response of more people saying, yes, I am willing to do this. We also found that people did in fact have the equipment. They had an iPad or they had a laptop. We eliminated, the committee eliminated the use of, of an iPhone. We felt that was not suitable, uh, couldn't produce a large enough picture in order to, to be participatory. And we also found that they were willing to learn or willing to come into the courthouse to learn. Uh, we've now had six, uh, six jury trials in the Western District of Washington. I tried four of them, Judge Zillies tried two. And we've only had to have one person come in uh, and use the equipment. Uh, had he been chosen to be on the jury, the equipment would go home with him. We also had one lady who had poor connectivity uh, living, in, living in the forest uh, north of Bellingham. And we sent her an iPad to use. Um, but other than that, we found that people were really far more uh, technically proficient than I had assumed. I was also worried we were going to cut out people generationally. That did not happen either. And I think we actually got a broader perspective because people only had to give us five hours out of their day rather than eight, nine, ten hours by the time that they commuted back and forth that created problems for childcare and everything else. But five hours a day, people were very willing to give. And Judge Rustin, we were seeing a bunch of questions yeah. about how, how, you know, how do you make sure that the witnesses are not being coached or they have you know, some sort of, a, someone's holding up a, a script for them. And you know, th this is a question we got from other trial judges when Judge Beckman did a presentation last week. And I just want to remind people that even in live trials, jurors are paying attention to things besides the witness on the witness stand, right? They're looking at the lawyers and how are they behaving at counsel table. And um, I, I had a case where the plaintiff uh, in, in uh, suing for personal injuries from a fall in a supermarket was so tender and sensitive to every movement in the courtroom, but then the jurors saw him getting into his Hummer in the parking lot across the street and saw he had no trouble getting up and getting in. Now, you're not supposed to consider that, but in a live trial, everything is in front of you. And uh, so I know that the Judge Peckman and other judges take precautions to make sure that witnesses are not being coached or have presentation. But one of the most interesting things to, I think the lawyers can talk about here is how do you do impeachment? And that was one that kind of stumped me until I heard them in our pre-discussion talk about that. Well, let me, I, let me, I'm sorry, go ahead. go ahead. I was just gonna pick that, pick that up. We cover many of these things in the handbook about how uh, the court is expecting. Yeah, there it is, Mike has it. Um, we cover many of these things about how witnesses uh, should be set up and how to deal with. But impeachment materials, what we worked out is that if the lawyer intended to use any impeachment material, including a deposition, the hard copies were sent to the witness in a sealed envelope. And so if uh, there was an impeachment question that required a deposition to be opened or some other document, they held up the, the sealed envelope in front of me and opened it right in front of me on Zoom, the same way you would have your court clerk open the deposition in the courtroom and we would use that funny little term, we are publishing the deposition, which really means 
you know, can I show it to him? And so that seemed to solve the impeachment problem. I knew that the documents that they were being impeached with were opened right there and that the witness did not have access to them previously. Did that work for you, Mark? Yeah, that, that worked great um, for impeachment. It was really, it was seamless. It, were, it really wasn't an issue. We agreed with the defense lawyers to provide them a copy an hour before, and they had an agreement that they couldn't talk to the witness about them. Um, and then, you know, I saw that came up a lot, uh, like Judge Lasnik, I saw that came a lot in the comments. And, you know, there's a couple of things. One is, as Judge Peckman said, it's addressed in the handbook. You're supposed to instruct your witnesses that they're to have nothing in front of them except for the exhibits. They can't have any communication with anyone. Um, and to some extent, we have to rely on the ethical rules, you know, just like in a regular trial, you have to rely on lawyers being ethical and not giving scripts and not coaching. And I think the combination of the handbook and the instructions in the handbook and the ethical rules that are in place, I just don't think it's a problem. I've now done two Zoom jury trials and I never had the sense that there was any funny business. And even though that seems to be the biggest worry of lawyers, it just, it doesn't seem like it's really happening. Mark, you agree? Is yeah. that your experience? Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. It seems like uh, it would be a, 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 very, a, very, a very huge mistake because uh, again, the, the jurors, uh, opposing counsel and the judge are very focused. They can set it up in speaker view and they are very focused on you and your eyes. And I think that it would be something that you would be able to see uh, if somebody were doing that. Um, at, so, and, and, and to try and script something like this uh, would, I don't think would be a, a very effective way to do it anyway. Um, but when it comes to impeachment, I think that is, a, it is challenging um, because uh, trying to think about all of the documents that you might need uh, for an impeachment, um, to have them there, uh, we agreed to do it a day in advance and then to also have hard copies to where the judge was located, similarly um, labeled envelopes that could be opened on the spot. Um, but also if there are just, if you have a witness that can't remember something and you don't necessarily have a document that's admissible or admitted and you want to use it to refresh recollection. And that, that's another thing that's um, a, a challenge. And you have to, I think you would probably want to treat that just like impeachment. We didn't have that issue come up, but um, it's something that you should think about if you're going to be planning for one of these. Well, it's not only the witnesses that um, our questioners have expressed concern about. How did you make sure the jurors weren't being coached or looking at other things? I mean, they're, they're in their homes. They didn't talk to family or, or go independently and look at something. Judge Peckman, did you want to, did you deal well, with it? Part, yes, we, we dealt with it. But again, part of it is really trust that I can't control them on what they look at when they go home at night. I can't control what they look at when they're waiting in the jury room or having lunch somewhere. And, you know, I know because I the, was the mother of a teenager who could actually text at the dinner table with her hand in her pocket um, <laughs> that, that if people are going to cheat on it, they're going to cheat on it. But these jurors really were very dedicated, everyone I've seen, and you talk about it every day. And you say, well, now it's time to be serious. Now it's time to take away any, any distractions. And you talk with your jurors about why that's important. And just like we have to trust that if something's going wrong in the jury room, they're going to speak up and tell us. The jurors are watching each other as well. But did I think that they were uh, not paying attention? Absolutely not. Um, I allow questions at the end of each witness, and you could tell by the questions that they were paying attention. Um, they were often bringing up points that um, the lawyers had failed to explain. Uh, we sometimes forget that we work on cases for years at a time, and for them, it's the first time they see it. Sometimes we use, we use shorthand, and that needs to be explained. But I didn't find anyone who was not diligent about paying attention, but ask the lawyers. 
Well, I, I think what Judge Peckman said is so key is Judge Peckman really, she's underplaying how much she emphasized that. I mean, she really explained to the jurors over and over again how important it was to really only pay attention and then why, you know, just that if somebody goes outside, we have, you know, the whole case has to get retried and all the expense that goes into this and the effort that goes into it, so the lawyers and the parties. And she, I am a hundred percent convinced based on how important Judge Peckman made that issue, that there was none of that going on, that you just can't have listened to that speech as many times as Judge Peckman gave it. Um, and as enthusiastically as she gave it and have the jurors um, look outside. I really don't think it happened. And, you know, we, we have for years said that the solemnity of the courtroom and people coming into a temple of justice and seeing the judge looming over them on the bench with a black robe is all part of setting up that atmosphere. And the fact that maybe we can actually do it in you know living rooms, bedrooms, uh, Judge Peckman in her home office, uh, and, and achieve the same result is something that may, many of us would have questioned beforehand, but we've seen it enough times now. Uh, and the people who are most opposed to doing Zoom civil jury trials, and I would still say that's a majority of the federal judiciary across the country, are people who have never tried to do one. And if you haven't done one or seen people do them, uh, you have those, uh, prejudices to fall back on. <clears throat> but I think that the proof of the pudding is, is actually in the trials, which have gone off without a hitch. And but getting back to that, um, Judge Williams in state court, he uh, surveyed the jurors and a number of women jurors said they felt that they were not mansplained to as much by male jurors, and they were able to be more uh, assertive in the deliberations as women uh, over this platform also. So um, it, it's going to require a lot of uh, study and, and taking more sophisticated data, but we may come up with some very interesting conclusions about fairness uh, in voir dire and in jury trials. Well, one of those areas that I think um, we may see some changes for the future is the presentation of experts. Um, Judge Lasnik already mentioned that how easy it was to have experts show up on short notice or um, just be available when needed. Um, did either of you have those experiences? Mark, what about you? In, in, uh... so, so we didn't have any experts, but we had, uh, this was a pharmaceutical case that uh, dealt with distribution in the Middle East. And so a lot of our witnesses were located in the Middle East and uh, in a normal trial, I mean, trying to get uh, them here and and ready to go and, and without jet lag and then that sort of thing and timed just right would have uh, would have been a you know a big burden and a whole added logistical uh, problem. And so we were able to uh, I mean, with the time zone was a was a problem uh, because of course they were testifying during our normal business day, and so that meant uh, I think some of them would start at. Uh, you know, 10 o'clock at night in, in Oman. <laughs> and uh, so that was a, a, that was the only issue, but I mean, how much more convenient it was, it, that was a huge benefit. Yeah. And uh, Judge Rossi, I just found that, it, um, frankly, it worked better um, than normal. You know, the jur the, because the jurors are closer to the expert and they c it's a little more intimate actually on Zoom and, you know, they're able to use models and show things and explain. And uh, the combination of not having to fly experts in from out of state and then having them to be able to be on the camera. It's also, I'll just point out that it's a huge cost savings to the parties because when you don't have to fly them out and pay for all that time and you just have somebody show up on Zoom, you know, um, 20 minutes before they testify, it's, it's a lot less expensive. So I thought it was, more effective putting on experts on Zoom than in person and much more convenient and, and a huge cost savings. One of the questions we just got was what public access was available? Um, you know, a lot of our trials in federal court are of interest um, to people, not just the criminal trials, but the civil trials. How did that work? Did, Judge Peckman, did we have public access available or what? 
Yes, and actually, this is one of the one of the bigger issues that the committee had had to work work through. And I don't know that uh, the state courts are facing the same issue because the federal system, primarily because of our uh, chief justice, doesn't believe that uh, our trials should be broadcast. So you can debate whether or not Zoom is a broadcast, but uh, what we did is that the public um, was given access to listen to any trial that they wanted to. And we post the link for them to, to listen on the court's website, just as if you would come into the courthouse and, and say, well, I wanna go watch something in Judge Peckman's court. We would have Judge Peckman, here's the link that you can listen to the trial. Um, we handled people observing the trial by invitation. And I was very generous with the invitations. I asked the parties ahead of time, you know, is, are there family members? Are there people that you want to have participate in this by supporting um, your clients through this process? Give us their information and we will give them a link so that they can actually observe. And I think Mr. Wampold had a case where there were family members who were observing. Uh, it, was a, it was an injury case. I also was very liberal with uh, allowing lawyers to come in and watch because I really wanted people to demystify this. And so if a lawyer basically said, I want to come watch or people from the various law firms wanted to come up watch, I said, fine, you know, what are they going to do to me? Take my parking spot? You know, uh, it just it just seemed that if somebody came to my courtroom door, I would not bar them. So if somebody came and asked, can I come in? I said, yes. Judge Peckman and I are products of the 60s. Uh, and even though we're federal judges, if a rule doesn't make sense, we don't think we have to follow it. <laughs> That's not quite true. Judge <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Rothstein, we had- I mean, a rule about cameras and uh, <laughs> public act that we will always air. No, I'm actually on the Ninth Circuit Cameras in the Courtroom Committee and we are surveying the districts about what are you doing about your Zoom cases? Are you doing uh, just audio to the public? Are you allowing uh, recording? Are you allowing video? And it varies across the board, but this is an opportunity for us as a federal court to let more people see what we do. And the more you see the federal judiciary, the more you have pride in there's one branch of government that actually works the way it should. And uh, so this is, you know, despite the Chief Justice coming up with this cockamamie system for oral arguments at the Supreme Court, where there's no Zoom, there's no camera, it's just audio, um, this is a, a major step forward. And, you know, I've actually sat on the Ninth Circuit twice during the pandemic, and we're doing all remote Zoom oral arguments on, on the Circuit Court. And uh, it's working you know, just great. And think of how much money is being saved to not fly, uh, not just judges, but entourages uh, to the different uh, parts of the, the Ninth Circuit. The one thing though I did learn there uh, is you don't want to do your argument on a telephone. You want to have a camera uh, platform like Zoom. Um, people who choose to appear by telephone, huge mistake. Okay. Let me just interrupt for a minute. For those who are joining us by phone, please note that the CLE verification code for today's program is 1985. The code will also be shared in the chat room. But for those of you who are joining us by phone, the code is 1985. Okay. Now, let me, let me ask, how did you handle exhibits? Were they a problem or were they something that was pretty easy? Do you wanna go first, Mark, or you sure. want me to? Uh, sure, I, so for, we had, in this case, we had about 250 exhibits marked and between both sides. And so it was not a very exhibit heavy case. And so I was able to handle them uh, myself and operate uh, I didn't. I didn't use any special software like I have in the past for trials. Um, I uh, had, uh, you know, some of them pre-highlighted and, and whatnot mm -hmm. for demonstrative purposes. But I was able to um, 
just use, pull up the exhibits in Adobe. And um, part of the procedures though, is to verify that anything that is shown to the jury is exactly the same as what the court has um, in, in box.com, which is the platform the court chose to give the jurors access to the exhibits. But um, just making sure uh, that uh, I had command of Adobe and I was able to share my screen, that was all I needed to do. How about you, Mike? Yeah, there's a couple of issues I'd say. One is that, you know, often in a regular trial, there's, you know, fights about exhibits, right? You offer something and there's an, uh, and there's an objection and you go back and forth. You know, on the Zoom platform, like Judge Lasnik said at the beginning, because it's a different medium and you're so close and intimate, I think it's really important to avoid those fights. I mean, if you think about it, it's quite rude. Um, when the jury's sitting there, all of a sudden the lawyer and the judge, the lawyers and the judge are having this long conversation about an exhibit and they're just sitting there lost. And, and so I really made an effort to try to deal with those outside the presence and Judge Peckman and, and the other judge that I tried to a Zoom jury trial in front of both were very gracious and you know agreeing, let's try to work this out so that we're, we're not spending that time in front of the jury. And so I think that's important is to try to deal with objections outside the presence of the jury. Um, in terms of displaying the exhibits, there's really two options, in my opinion. Um, one is you have to have a presentation software that you're comfortable with and that you can use fastly. I used PowerPoint. It worked great. I had no problems with the exhibits. Frankly, I thought um, what I did worked better than my opponent who used a consultant. And But that's another option. If you're not comfortable with the technology, there are consultants out there that will do this for you. I think using a consultant in a Zoom trial works much better than using a consultant in a real trial um, because it's almost like you're talking to God. You know, you say, you know, Mr. So-and-so, could you bring up exhibit four? No one sees Mr. So-and-so, so you don't see him sitting there futzing around with the computer. All of a sudden, exhibit four is just there. Poof, magic. Um, so, you know, I, I thought that actually worked quite well, but I think what worked even better was just managing the exhibits on PowerPoint myself. Um, you, you do have to um, vouch under the handbook that what you're showing the jury is exactly what is in the record, which is on box.com. And so you have to make sure it's the same, but I really would not recommend trying to manipulate box.com in front of the jury. I think that's very clumsy. Yeah. And so you need to figure out a, a software presentation tool that you're gonna use to be able to show that easily. I, I will say just added on top of that judge that uh, the jurors seem very interested in the exhibits more so than in a normal trial where they're leaning over to, to see someone else's monitor. Um, here, they, uh, you know, they really were uh, able to, I think, to see the documents that could uh, occupy the, most of their screen. And um, I just felt like I got more engagement on, on the documents when I showed it to them. That's interesting that they would feel more closer to yeah. reading these uh, Judge Peckman, you want to answer? Yes, um, this is actually one of the things um, I saw somebody wanted to know what the jurors thought of this. All of these jurors were debriefed, um, either by me or by Judge Zilly. And we have, you know, we had the record going with the lawyers in the room, uh, talking with them, not about the substance of the case, but about their experience on Zoom. So, you know, we have all of that all of that information about what jurors thought of the experience. And one of the things that I heard repeatedly through the four trials that I did is that they felt that they could actually see the exhibits better. Um, and they were able at home, you know, they have their own computer, their own iPad, they can adjust the light source, they can adjust the size of the print. Um, and so they were able to absorb it. Um, I even had one, uh, one juror who was really quite high tech and one of the lawyers said, judge, he's, he's obviously got another monitor. He's doing work elsewhere. Well, come to find out that this guy was able to, he had one monitor for just his exhibits and the other monitor, you know, for the, uh, testimony. And, and he says, I, I wanted to really be able to read the exhibits. So yes, he was using two monitors, but um, he was doing exactly what it is we would like to have them do. I tried one case that was a very complicated police misconduct case. And I have to say the 
the exhibits were stunning because it was like watching television. We had aerial photographs. We had maps of the city. There were 23 different police cars who were involved in a chase. So we were watching cars zooming all over the place as we were uh, going along. And it couldn't, we couldn't have pulled that off in the courtroom where everyone would have such a good view. In addition, when they deliberate, the jurors are able, each juror can call down the exhibits that they wanna see out of the box platform. So while they deliberate, juror number one can you know, have exhibits 25, 36, and 104, and somebody else could say, yeah, but let's take a look at 202. Um, they also can look at the same exhibit at the same time if they wish. It's a, it's a far cry from the old days of passing around you know, paper and binders um, back in the jury room. Those days, are, those days are gone. Marcia, can you talk about the role of the bailiff and the courtroom deputy? Because we've got some questions in these okay. areas about, uh, you know, do, they, do they observe deliberations? How do they make sure jurors are paying attention? What are they doing with the technology? Well, it is it is very much like uh, the real the real thing um, that you have in the in the courthouse is that the jurors are invited into the virtual jury room. They know that they are going to be removed to the virtual jury room. Nobody can get in there except through the bailiff, which is just the same as in a, in a real trial. The bailiff does not sit there and watch the deliberations. It is. It is, uh, you know, they literally go into the same black box. They deliberate together through the chat. They basically uh, can ask their questions if they have them. Um, so the chat questions would, uh, they know to go to the bailiff. The bailiff uh, sends me any questions. We use the same process in consulting the lawyers. When the verdict comes in, they basically let the bailiff or the courtroom deputy know that the verdict is ready. Um, we, we figured out how to have a, P, a fillable PDF so that they actually can fill out the verdict form. Um, one juror actually figured out how to put his real signature on it because he was a techie. <laughs> um, and, you know, I was notified of the verdict. We bring the jurors back. We, I read the verdict form. We pull the jury, and Bob's your uncle. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it works just, just the same way. What about sidebars during the trial? Where, did you have many? Were you, what, how do you set it up technically so you, I guess you have to shut the jury out? How do you do that? Well, I'm going to say easy peasy. It's easier than in the live courtroom, but... Uh, Mike, why don't you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, it just, it worked. It's one of those things where you would never dream ahead of time how much better it is. But on Zoom, that's one thing that goes, the, the, it is so much better. The jurors instantly are sent by the bailiff to the jury room and you can talk and then you instantly bring them back. You know, again, it's one of those things that is actually sort of humiliating, you know, making these jurors all stand up. Hey, you go away while we talk. And this is just so fast. It's just not as big of an imposition on the jurors. You send them to the jury room. They're back in the jury room. You talk quickly. Everybody has a little more sense of pressure, right? Let's get going. And you talk quickly, you deal with it and bring them back. So I thought that worked very well. And it raises another point, which is I think we get these trials done faster because there's not all of those types of interruptions where you have to get all the jurors to stand up and wait for them to leave the room. I think things like that and waiting for witnesses, it's just, there's a lot of efficiencies that are built in that make you try these cases faster. I, I actually have kept track of the time lost um, in each of my trials for things like a, a juror losing connectivity or something. It has been less than in the real courthouse where people, you know, I couldn't park my car. I got stuck in security. You know, there was a line at the bathroom. You know, all of those things slow trials down. And um, we didn't have those issues. And um, nobody had to share the bathroom. They all had their own. <laughs> In, well, at me, their homes. Let me ask you, um, 
the question I was going to ask, and I think a couple of people have already asked it, what of these things do you think we will retain? And how much of this do you think we'll keep doing even after um, the COVID crisis is over? Are there aspects that we've discovered through this remote civil trial that we're going to want to keep? Um, will it change the way we do things? What, what do you think? And we can start, Judge Lasnik, let's start with you and go around because I'm now, curious. I, I think that uh, jury, uh, jury selection, uh, especially voir dire, uh, the days of bringing in 70 people into the courthouse and um, having them fill out questionnaires and dealing with them, you know, uh, in a large room uh, with lawyers and judges firing questions at a great distance is probably the thing that we'll, we will not come back to the most. I think we will do remote jury selection, uh, even in criminal cases, uh, and, um, but especially in civil. And I think that experts uh, testifying uh, long distances away and vocally um, will become not uh, an everyday occurrence uh, in every trial, but will be done more easily. Uh, I think we'll still be resistant to telephone testimony, but I think uh, remote uh, Zoom-like testimony from expert witnesses especially uh, will, will linger. Now, at a judge's meeting, uh, one of our fellow judges who shall remain nameless, except it was Judge Kunauer, said, <laughs> as soon as we get back to life, I don't want to ever hear about any remote anything again. So it's going to vary. We're not going to adopt a, a Western District rule that is going to force judges to do this. But I think that, um, you know, you can't even say it's generational because, you know, Tom Zilli is 86 years old and he adapted. Uh, so, but I think it's going to vary around the country because each court has its own culture. In the Western District of Washington, we will take some of these things and, and, and make them work for the long haul. Don't you think, Marcia? Yeah, and, and I would say back to Judge Kunauer, um, at the end of 2020, Judge Kunauer had tried no cases and all of his cases had met uh, any, any form of justice. And I'm happy to say that every single case that I had set in 2020 got tried in 2020. Now I worked like a dog to do it, but <laughs> it happened because that, that, that was all crammed in between October and December. Mike, what do you think? So, well, I, I, agree, I agree with with everything Judge Lasnik said. I, I think those are the things that are going to stay. I mean, I, I mentioned um, uh, to this group previously that, you know, I tried a case in King County Superior Court two weeks ago. Um, there were 70 jurors summoned for this particular case, and we ended up in paneling seven. Um, so that's 63 people that didn't need to come to the courthouse um, you know, that's just a huge savings for society. And I think it makes people enjoy their jury service more. We get better, um, as, as Judge Peckman pointed out, we get um, the data shows that people are, are responding more to the jury summons. And so I think um, I would be shocked if doing um, voir dire the way we are on, on a um, Zoom type platform doesn't stay. And I agree with Judge Lasnik. I think Judges, I think, will have seen that um, having jurors or having witnesses testify this way, particularly treaters and treating doctors and experts, um, and even people who live out of state, out of the country, I mean, to be able to do it this way, I think that will remain. Mark, what do yeah. you think? Well, you know, I agree. I, I think that um, there's a lot of my trial prep that I will adjust uh, and keep doing it over Zoom. Um, witness prep and depositions are a lot more convenient. Uh, uh, you don't have to travel. And, uh, and so there's a lot of that that I'll continue, you know, regardless of what happens with, uh, uh, what, if we're going to try the case uh, remotely. But uh, there are a lot of savings and it, I wouldn't be surprised to see a lot of it stick around. I bet there are tremendous cost savings in depositions if you can do depositions um, by Zoom and have everybody present um, with the witness and not have the lawyers traveling all over 
Mark, you look like you want to say something. Jenny. Yeah, I, I would say that a lot of the prep work for for trials, you know, even if we actually do the trial in the courthouse, a lot of the prep work will be done over Zoom um, because now we don't have that. I mean, half of the lawyers who appear in the Western District of Washington on civil cases are coming from out of the district. You know, they come from Los Angeles, they come from New York, they come from all over the place. And so the fact that they don't have to basically, you know, get on a plane, spend two days, one day coming, one day going to have, you know, a 20 minute argument or even a two hour uh, pretrial conference uh, it's got to be a tremendous savings. I mean, everyone complains that federal court is too expensive. Well, guess what? Maybe we just have broken through the barrier that we can we can do some things that make more people able to participate. Let me ask this. Those of you who I guess Judge Peckman, you and Judge Zilly have spoken to the jurors after the trial. And were they, what was their reaction to it? Did they have any um, contributions as to how to make it better? Were, what, what were their reactions pretty much? Yeah. Well, both of these gentlemen um, sat through those briefings in, in their respective oh, okay. trials. But I, I would say that, you know, overwhelmingly people seem to be pleased with it. And um, they were grateful that, um, they were grateful that they got a chance to participate uh, and they took it very seriously. I think one of the most interesting things that there was a juror who had actually done a Zoom trial in Thurston County, not a Zoom trial, I'm sorry, an in-person trial in Thurston County during COVID. And he says, I could evaluate the witnesses much better because I could see them as opposed to being in the courtroom with my mask on and sitting 25, 30, 40 feet away. That was stunning to me. Um, we did ask, did they feel that they could evaluate uh, the witnesses? And again, they said yes. Um, personally, the first, the first trial that Mr. Wampold was in, I was kind of stunned that you know for 30 plus years I've been evaluating witnesses by looking at the side of their face and all of a sudden I actually was looking people you know straight on I, I was like a little taken aback that oh my goodness I actually could see their faces and I thought back that I don't get to see their faces um, I get to listen to their voice and see the side of their see the side of their head and Kind of even in bench trials, while we continue to do that, I don't know. And I think uh, Judge Peckman makes a great point is that the comparison is not the Zoom jury trial to the way we used to do it. If you try to put on a trial now under these circumstances in the courtroom, you have uh, the mask issue, you have the social distancing issue, you have to wipe everything down. Uh, every time a different witness comes to the witness stand, you have uh, plastic shielding, you have to separate into separate courtrooms for um, jury selection. Uh, the jury rooms for deliberation are not set up well for uh, COVID type situations. So you can't take it and look just back at the way we used to do it versus the way we're doing it now. As Judge Peckman said, if we're going to keep doing the justice system, we have to consider an alternative and this alternative is working out really great. Mike, did you wanna add what your impressions were after meeting with the jurors afterward? Yeah, I mean, the um, you know, as many uh, watchers know in federal court, usually you don't get to talk to the, uh, the lawyers don't get to talk to the jurors afterwards. Um, so it was a, a, a treat for us to get to listen to them. But one juror summed up their experience, I thought, and it per put it perfectly. They said, I was so happy to be able to do my civic duty and use my own bathroom. 
<laughs> and that kind of summed it all up. I mean, that sort of summed up the jury experience. And, you know, you could see, I love the comment because you could see them during the trial. They were, as Judge Peckman said, paying such close attention. They were very invested. They were asking great questions, but they're also in the comfort of their home. I mean, you could see them sitting on their living room couch or in their bedroom and they were very comfortable and yet doing their civic duty. And uh, so I love that comment because I thought it really did sum up that it what a great experience it has been for the jurors and you know judge lastnick's right if you compare that to jurors who've tried cases during covid it's just horrible i mean there's you know king county very shortly i think before the case i tried with judge peckman it was either shortly before or shortly after but they had a case where you know everybody's socially distanced in the courtroom it's just weird and then the jurors start deliberating and the four person came down with a fever and so then, you know, the four persons out, they brought in an alternate, but then they're like, well, wait a second. Ultimately, there was a mistrial because all these jurors were dropping off because they're developing symptoms. And, you know, meanwhile, we tried this case. We had no issues. Nobody has masks on. Nobody has to social distance. There's nobody in the same room. It just it's, it's just it's such a superior product for trying a case under these circumstances. Mark, what was your impression? You know, in our case, uh, we talked to the jurors and they seem to uh, have taken it very seriously. They were very, very uh, focused during the whole trial. And they were asked after um, if they thought that the Zoom platform uh, created distractions and, and uh, provided some sort of barrier for them to uh, fully participate and listen. And, and, and they were all sort of universally happy with the with the ability to be able to participate over zoom um and and so there were just we didn't have any issues in talking to the jury after our trial and i would say that there were a lot of benefits in having your witness in one uh screen and then having all the jurors uh right next to it you can adjust your screen so that um you can see all of the jurors while you're questioning your witness and so you can really get in real time reactions from the, from the jury to the testimony that you're getting from your witness uh, that you would just miss out on um, uh, in a normal setting because you're engaged with your witness and they're off to, the, off to the side. So there were great benefits to that. Do you, either of you have any recommendations for handling a hostile witness through Zoom? I, I personally think that, you know, there, there was a hostile witness. I don't know if Judge Peckman recalls, but there was an expert uh, who was a lawyer, actually, who got a little hostile with me. I, I thought, frankly, that it just it, it, it looks worse for the witness. And so I think the key is you have to make sure you're not getting hostile. I think what Judge Lasnik said at the beginning is right, is that it, the platform is too intimate. Jurors don't want you in their face getting mad and yelling. Um, that's not what they want. And so I think the, the truth is, if you have a hostile witness, um, it's going to inure to their detriment and to your benefit. And the key for you is you have to keep your cool um, because it's just it, it, there is something about the space of a courtroom that diffuses things. If you're having a fight with a witness and the jurors are 20 feet away, it's very different than being on this platform. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree. And I think I don't think it's it's uh, hugely different in dealing with a hostile witness in that. If they're not going to be answering your questions, uh, evasive questions, uh, failure to answer, those sorts of things are going to be communicated. The juror is going to pick up on those just as they would in a live setting. Okay, I, and some of the questions that we're getting now are really um, very, very practical, and I'm going to ask one of them. Um, in jury trials that I have tried over the years, there is the phenomenon known as the sleeping juror, um, which is often awkward for the attorneys and the other jurors and the judge. How would you handle something like that? And let me ask it in a broader sense. Do you recommend having somebody watch the jurors for you while you're busy putting on the case? Um, what, what, what do you do about that? Um, well, can I, can I, actually, we have two court employees who are watching at all times. And I know that the state system can't afford to do that, but, but that's what we have. So we, I've got two courtroom deputies 
who are basically, one is basically moving people in and out. The other one is watching to make sure that everybody's paying attention. It's just like the real courtroom. You see people nod off. You know, I get a, I get a chat, judge number five needs a break. So all of a sudden, guess what? We all stand up, we take a stretch, you know, we do the hokey pokey and, you know, we sit back down. Um, but it's no different. And, you know, the sleeping juror is always going to be with us. To be perfectly honest, um, sometimes I think that uh, lawyers look up at me, what are we going to do about the sleeping juror? And I'm going, that's not my problem. That's your problem. It's true. <laughs> It's, true. it's usually a sign. It's not usually a problem with the jurors. It's usually a problem with the lawyers. We are boring them. So, I mean, whenever Judge Peckman, whenever I heard her say, let's stand up and take a stretch, I thought about, okay, what am I doing that I could be a little more interesting? Because, you know, that's usually what the issue is. Okay. And court reporters. There's a, been a question about court reporters. Do they have problems with this? How do you know? How quickly can they tell you? wait a minute, stop, I didn't hear that or whatever. So, so we had a really uh, big issue with that in our trial because most of our witnesses uh, were not native English speakers. And so we had interpreters for some and some of the interpreters had very heavy accents. So we often had the court reporter chiming in, I did not get it. And at one point uh, we had to, Judge Peckman's like, I you know, had to stop things and said, you know, we're not getting a record here and we need to do something about it. So we came up with this um, idea uh, that what we would do is have the um, witness, I can't remember exactly how, if it was the witness answering in, in English, uh, but we went, yeah, the witness was, um, had enough command of English to put it into the chat. And so we uh, stipulated that the chat answers would, would be what we would put into the record. And in many ways it saved the, the trial. Sure. And this is, this was me just, you know, scratching my head and saying, how are we going to salvage this? Because I'm not sure we could have in the, uh, in the courthouse, but because we had the chat feature on Zoom, we had a witness who um, was not a, was not a English speaker, a native English speaker, but spoke English. The problem was the accent issue. So he typed out his answers and that became the record. But I'd like to talk a little bit about court reporters. Um, the court reporters uh, actually, when we did our um, seminar and I should mention that if people think that this, that uh, the federal system is not interested in this, um, the Western District of Washington put on a seminar uh, for federal judges and their staff. And we had 1,022 logins. And uh, whole districts were sitting uh, watching this. So um, people are, are keenly interested. But the court reporters have reported that they think it's better. It is easier for them to take the record, particularly during voir dire, than it is in the courtroom. Because they can, um, they can modulate the, how uh, loud it is for them. They can put on their headphones. And I have set up real time. So I have, in addition to the monitors, I have, I have my iPad with the real time so I can read what they're getting and I can see immediately if something's going wrong. And they can, they can notify me when we got a problem. And then it becomes the same as if it were in the, in the courtroom. You know, what's the last question you got? Let's back up. Let's make sure that we got that answer. We did the same thing when we had people have connectivity problems. You know, we backed up the testimony and I could tell immediately when, when somebody went offline and, you know, I can throw down a marker there. And so when we bring them back and we know what it is that they missed and we can go back over it again. Well, Judge Beckman, let me ask you this. Um, in the course of doing here six trials, have you found that there were things you needed to change or improve um, as time goes on? 
Well, I think one of the things that, that happened is I think I got better at my explanations um, from the first case to the last case. These gentlemen represent the first one and the last one. Um, and I think I became more sensitive to the awkwardness of Zoom. You know, how do you get a jury to, how do you get a jury to gel um, if they're not waiting in the, in the jury room, um, cooling their heels while we're doing something else? And so, you know, I just started doing little icebreakers. I would have conversations with them um, in the morning. Um, you know, we had one trial that was around Thanksgiving. So I said, okay, who's doing the bird? Uh, we had discussions about, you know, family traditions. I think I used my, um, my uh, what, is a, what is a bar besides a place to get a drink? Um, a little uh, riddle that leads me into how important people are who are inside the bar and they are inside the bar. And so, you know, if I use, I, if I'm in my courthouse, I use the artwork um, to illustrate various um, issues about the importance of jurors. And I just had to be a little more creative about how to do that on Zoom. But I think that that was the big issue the other thing I'm going to say is that I have never been more nervous, you know, in the past 30 years uh, than I was starting Mr. Wampole's trial. You know, I was, it was like I was doing it for the first time again. And um, I think that's, you got to count on that and work through it. And if everybody comes with goodwill, uh, you can work through it. Well, let me ask the lawyers um, to emphasize a couple of things, if you can talk about it. The need for cooperation between the lawyers, if this is going to work. Cooperation, I would assume, in, in admitting exhibits, in handling the preparation of how many days and what days you're going to call your witnesses. I think all of the things that require cooperation among attorneys um, in a regular trial may become even more important in a remote trial. Do either of you want to comment on that? Mark, you're nodding uh, your head. Maybe. You know, I, I would say so. We definitely had, um, uh, Mike was mentioning on how, it, you know, important it might be to get agreements on exhibits and to avoid some uh, objections uh, during the trial, but we actually had a handful of hotly contested exhibits that, um, and, you know, it doesn't, you know, cooperation doesn't mean you have to fold a, a, a meritorious position on a document. Um, and we uh, went through the paces, just like you would in the normal courtroom, laying the foundation um, and uh, moving for the admission of evidence over objections. And that happened in our in our case, um, so I mean, I, I, cooperation is always important. Um, uh, I, 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 you know, I, I don't know if it's more so in this or not, but uh, uh, I think the, the main point I wanted to make is that uh, you know objections I felt worked out uh, like they would in the normal courtroom. Um, in the handbook, I think uh, uh, it was said that you should raise your hand. I, I think I, I just sort of dispensed with that and sort of the other side when, when there was, uh, when the testimony was going into an area that I knew was going to uh, be objectionable, um, um, you know, I did, you know, I was on high alert and um, I just voiced my objection and uh, the judge was able to make a ruling uh, just like it would happen in, in the normal courtroom, so. Yeah, I, guess, I guess what I would say is I think there's an incentive to cooperate more just because it is more intimate. You know, it's like there's something about the courtroom and the judge being far away. It's like, you know, you don't want to look to, you know, Judge Lasnik or Judge Peckman or you, Judge Rothstein. You don't want to be on Zoom getting scolded. It, there's something much more intimate about it. So I think it just leads to um, more cooperation because nobody wants to be in that position where they're, they're getting um, uh, reprimanded on Zoom. It's just uncomfortable. We've had a number of questions about whether open and close closings 
statements and arguments um, are different uh, in a Zoom trial? Are they shorter or what do you think? Um, Mike, what, what's your... So uh, the, um, I'd say a couple things about opening and closing. I actually thought that worked better on Zoom. Um, and the reason I'd say that is because, you know, is it, if anybody's ever watched the president of the United States give the State of the Union and um, watch and think, wow, how do they stand up for an hour and give this, you know, perfect speech? Well, the reality is they have teleprompters, right? And that we don't have. Well, now guess what? In a Zoom trial, you get a teleprompter. Um, if you use your screen right, you really can do a teleprompter. And what you do is you use PowerPoint and you use um, a slide dis a slideshow display. And basically what you do is you share your monitor, you use two monitors and you share the monitor that only has the PowerPoint slides. So all the jury is seeing are the PowerPoint slides, but what you see on your screen is your slide and the notes to yourself of what you wanna talk about in each one. So I found opening and closed to be much better on Zoom because I was able to look in the screen, I'm looking at like I'm looking right at the jurors, but actually I'm looking at my notes. And so you can get up there and talk for an hour. I think my close was an hour and a half. Maybe that was too long for Zoom. Judge Peckman can tell you um, whether it was, but I talked for an hour and a half in my close and you know I, it, it was seamless because I had those notes there. So um, I, I don't think opening and closing were much different than in a in a in person trial. And um, and I, I found the technology made it better. So so one thing Judge Peckman had us do, which I think was maybe new for our trial. Uh, was that she had the lawyer stand. Um, and, and so uh, I felt like, and so I ended up getting this desk and this is the same desk I was at. And, and basically I would, you know, raise it up when like this, and I would uh, have my uh, argument here and I was able to use my hands. I was able to sort of um, emphasize things. And, and so I felt like standing, you know, was a very important thing to do and to keep it as normal as possible for opening and closing. Uh, and I would say the other thing that I did, uh, which was different from the normal trial, is I really emphasized in my closing uh, lists of the key exhibits. And, and I, I should do this in the regular trial, but uh, I knew that I wasn't going to be able to shift between mediums. And I think a lot of times closing can just sort of creep up on you in a trial. It's like all of a sudden evidence is done and oh, we're going to close this afternoon. And so um, you are uh, scrambling to get things together. And, but I mean, I, I wanted, I, I actually had my closing written, you know, beforehand, which is again, something I probably should do in a normal trial. Um, but I really emphasized in those closing slides, the key exhibits so that I could say to the jurors, you know, you're going to have access. Each one of you is going to have access to these. Now, if you want to see the key documents that are important to the formation of this contract that's at issue, you're going to look at exhibit 20. This is that document you saw a lot. This is important because of, and really uh, giving them a roadmap on which were the important exhibits for them to check out. And so my closing was not so much showing them the exhibits as it was giving them that roadmap because I knew that they were going to uh, use that in their deliberations. Mm. I think that's very helpful um, to the people who are asking these questions about opening and closing. Judge Lasnik, you think you'll ever try a bench trial in a courtroom again, or is it so much better and remote? Oh, I think I'll still try them in the courtroom. Uh, you know, I, I, I think that, um, I think this is something to add to our repertoire, but I don't think it replaces for, for every single case. The, the trial, either the bench trial or the jury trial in the courtroom. But, you know, I, I think back and, and, you know, you've got 40 plus years of, of trial judging and Marsha and I 30 plus years of trial judging. And, you know, we went through some sea changes in the courtroom too, when we started seeing PowerPoints, right? That was totally new. And we saw some people do it well, and we saw some people do it terribly, right? The PowerPoint just shows you exactly what the person said, right? Dead, no, wrong. And I think we're gonna get that. The great lawyers, and we have some great lawyers here and we just got a question from Beth Bloom and she and Ada Wong had a case and you know, they're great lawyers. 
are able to adjust and we're going to have other people who are just kind of go like, oh my God, there's no platform that this person will ever be able to succeed on. And, and, and it's just part, part of what we're seeing. The, 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 being a trial lawyer and being a trial judge is an evolutionary process. We're learning, they're learning, but I don't think it ever takes the place for all times, for all cases of being in a beautiful courthouse like our United States courthouse and, uh, and in our own courtrooms with chambers down the hall and our courtroom deputies here and our court reporters there. Uh, so I hope we don't completely change. Well, we're not gonna completely change, but one of the things that's happened is I think, and then I'm gonna let Judge Peckman wrap it up, is that the courts, at least our court, and those of us here tonight have shown that the courts can rise to an emergency situation. I mean, this is an emergency because the alternative is not to have any cases tried for who knows how long. And I think Judge Peckman made up her mind that wasn't gonna happen and found a very creative way of getting people justice. So Judge Peckman, I'm gonna ask you one question that may be a difficult one to answer. What is your reaction to the objection? Um, there is always, not always, but often a side that objects, just objects in general principles to the fact that they're not in a regular courtroom. And, well, I think, yeah. I think that Judge Lasnik uh, hit on at the beginning is that most of the people who object or are writing pieces about objecting have actually not done it and or have not watched it or have not taken the time to be a creative thinker about it. And so I actually think that we have a rare opportunity to take this crisis and make some things better. Um, you know, this is a chance in the future to basically design your own trial. You know, we may have jurors that are, that are selected remotely, but um, deliberate in person. We may have experts that testify remotely. We may have an opportunity to do some very creative things. Um, but if people are gonna dig in their heels and say, I don't want to, I'm not gonna consider it, you know, it's impossible. Well, then they're gonna be stuck and frozen in time. And uh, the rest of us are gonna move on. The federal judiciary has tried cases in Quonsonets in gymnasiums, and now we're trying cases in people's homes. And we should be thankful that the American public is willing to invite us in. I think that's a pretty good way to end, unless anybody has something else they want to add. I want to uh, add Duncan? an amen to what yeah. Judge Peckman just said. Can we get an amen? <laughs> amen from all of us. Exactly. Duncan, I think we're going to turn it over to you, right? Thank you, Judge Rothstein. Uh, so just a couple of minutes. Uh, on behalf of the Federal Bar Association of the Western District of Washington, thank you to everyone who made this evening's program possible, including all our participants from all around the Ninth Circuit and beyond. Um, you, you asked uh, a, a large number of really terrific questions. I wish we'd been able to get to all of them. Um, but this is obviously a very rich topic. Uh, I want to express our deep gratitude to Judge Rothstein uh, and our fabulous panel, Judge Peckman, Judge Lasnik, Mark Walters, Mike Wampold for their time in putting together this wonderful presentation. Uh, thanks to our program sponsor, the NJCHS. Uh, for more information about the NJCHS, please visit their website at www.njchs.org. Uh, now, as I mentioned at the outset, this is uh, this was the second part of a two-part series on courts during COVID. I want to thank our fellow CLE sponsors, in particular Hughes Hubbard for sponsor sponsoring the California MCLE and the FBA of Idaho for sponsoring the Idaho CLE. Uh, thanks also to our partner FBA chapters in Arizona, the Eastern District of California, the Northern District of California. Orange County, Idaho, and Oregon for helping us get the word out about this series. Uh, and then finally, thank you to the Perkins Cooley Law Firm for so generously sponsoring spaces uh, for new students and new lawyers to be able to attend today. 
Uh, good night, everybody. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody.